Um, good afternoon, everyone. For quite a long time now, people have been telling me that I should tell my story, that I need to share it, write a book, they've said. I was very reluctant to do this at first because all of us have a story to share. All of us have something to say, and we all contribute to the lives of others because our stories are the threads that bind humanity together. And I feel that I am nothing special, I'm nothing different, apart from the fact that I wear hats all the time, and that's another story in itself that I won't go into today. But I, I first realised that my life experiences and the way I travelled through them could help others. They could influence behaviour or even just sow the seed that we can all survive adversity and we can all make the world a better place. And I became compelled to write it. So in 1999, I began a journey, and it was a journey I wasn't very keen on taking at the time, but it's something that's changed the course of my life and has far-reaching consequences, more than I could ever have envisaged at the time. It was the path to a friendship, a friendship that wasn't just to develop between me and the small village of Soibada in Timor-Leste, but between that area of Timor and the whole of the northern beaches of Sydney. It's been an incredible journey. It was inevitable that I'd end up in the military, really. Not only has my family been tied to the Defence Force through many generations, but I actually, and my mum will hate me telling you this, came about as the result of an officer's function and my dad being thrown in the River Dart. To top that off, my parents gave me the initials of the training course that dad was on at the time, the Torpedo Anti-Submarine Course, Tamara Ann Sloper. I was in the full-time Navy for almost 19 years and I'm still in the Navy Reserve. I'm married to an Army officer and I'm a full-time mother to our four teenagers. I can tell you that this job is more challenging than anything I faced in the Navy and without the glory, the medals or the pay. But I'm fortunate. I'm fortunate to be living a very full and exciting life. However, as a veteran, there's an aura of sadness about it sometimes. It's a life that's been shaped by events I've been part of or witnessed to. A life that's full of challenges and ultimately positive outcomes, although it often takes time for me to see that. It does seem to be part of a bigger picture, part of a plan, and it's something larger than me. It's not all been smooth sailing, and at times it's been difficult to, to accept what I feel I've been called to do. It's become evident that every trauma, every obstacle I have faced has led to something good, not always for me, but for someone. In the 1980s, the military was a challenge for women, and sometimes it still is. My time at the Defence Academy was fraught with trauma. That's had long-lasting effects. I have nightmares still about certain incidents. However, the training that followed at the Naval College, HMAS Creswell, gave me the deep insight into the camaraderie and the bonds we feel in the service. Those midshipmen in my class actually saved me. My initial postings were as an administrative officer, generally in personnel management and community support areas. This included public relations and media and other staff officer roles. It included time at sea on board HMAS Stalwart and HMAS Tobruk. After I qualified as an intelligence officer, I had operational postings in Maritime Headquarters, Headquarters Australian Theatre, and at sea on the American ship USS Coronado. In Bougainville and Papua New Guinea, I was part of the peacekeeping force there. However, it was my deployment as a member of the Interfet Peacekeeping Force under General Sir Peter Cosgrove in September of 1999 to Timor-Leste, which we used to call East Timor. That really changed the course of my life. So my book begins on the 11th of September, 1999. It was a glorious spring day. It was the day of our wedding. Up in Manly on the hill, overlooking the Pacific at the Cardinal Soretti Memorial Chapel. As Dad and I drove down the gravel drive admiring, admiring the view, I realised that my military timing had made us a tad early. People were still parking their cars. So off around the block we drove. I was dressed in a heavy cream satin gown that my mum had made for me. I'd beaded it with pearls and crystals that caught the light. My husband-to-be, Adrian, was strikingly handsome in his dress uniform, and he'd hate me telling you that, but it's true. We had a full nuptial mass, complete with a military guard of honour and swords. The reception was upstairs in the dining room of the old sandstone seminary. 
I'd handmade ribbon roses as table decorations and the place was magical. It was the stuff of fairy tales and little girl's dreams. But as we rose to cut the cake and do the speeches, my dainty little bag started to move across the table as the heavy brick of a mobile phone rang. Everything changed in an instant. I was told I was deploying to Timor-Leste at the earliest opportunity. The wedding dress was switched for body armour and cams. The veil replaced by a helmet. The bridal bouquet became a Steyr rifle. The RAF Hercules landed in the capital city of Dili. With no windows, we couldn't see what we were going to face on landing. There was gunfire coming from the outer edge of the runway but we were blinded by the acrid smoke that assaulted our nostrils and made our eyes water. Deploying like this was new to me. I was more used to huge warships, complete with running water and flushing toilets. A young soldier grabbed me and pushed me down, helping me struggle towards what was left of the terminal. It was the smell of decay and burning buildings that stays with me still. It felt surreal, but oddly, my greatest concern was running into army officers who may have trained with me at the Defence Academy. I would rather have faced the machete-wielding militia in the jungle than see those men again. I served in Timor as an intelligence officer attached to the ground force. Conditions were extremely basic and the environment was high threat. For a start, it wasn't where I expected to be during my honeymoon. Destruction and death were everywhere. The country was on fire. On arrival at Obrigado Barracks, an old Indonesian army structure that still bore evidence of the atrocities that took place there. I was supposed to live with the people I worked with and they were mostly army. The Navy hierarchy insisted that I live in the building with them. I'm still not sure if the senior officers were aware of the positive ramifications of that decision. My fear of those army people from my past was ever present. I felt safer in the Navy quarters. I was one of only two women accommodated with 40 or more men, and that was interesting. The weapon I was issued was, the um, was new to me, and as was the responsibility of carrying live rounds. I was constantly terrified. However, I was very fortunate. I was fortunate that I got to travel out to the districts and see a lot of the country. My exposure to the sufferings of the civilian population following the atrocities they endured led to my passionate involvement and desire to help. I became involved with orphanages, schools and local women's groups. I promised I would always remember them. It would prove impossible over time for me to forget the pain the fear and the grief in the eyes of a mother holding her dead child, or the teenage girl who'd been repeatedly raped by the militia for not expo exposing her brother's hiding place. All of this violence put into perspective any bad experiences I'd had at the hands of cadets at the Defence Academy. During those first weeks in Dili, it felt as though the Timorese women, so gentle yet so brave and fiercely protective of their families, healed me of my past traumas by sharing with me their own. I drew on their strength, their resilience, and their positivity and faith. It was the most extraordinary experience. There are many stories from that time I spent in Dili in September 1999, but one of the most difficult for me, and it does haunt me to this day, was during the wet season. The wet season was nothing like the rain we experienced here in Sydney. It was so heavy, the actual raindrops were so thick that your eyes would fill with water and it became difficult to see. It was heavy enough that you could stand outside and wash your hair in it. The weather, however, rendered the unsurfaced roads extremely dangerous. I'd met an Australian aid worker when visiting an orphanage in the hills. She called me late one rainy night to ask for my help. She wanted me to bring the army doctor. One of the children had been hurt. My instant response was to run to her aid. However, I had to stand back and consider the consequences of our actions. There was much more at stake here than just the well-being of a child. I knew for a fact that the area surrounding the orphanage was riddled with militiamen. 
It was dark, no lights in the jungle, the roads in the mountain were extremely dangerous. Large parts of them had washed away. In fact, I'd been in an accident the week before where our vehicle slid off the road. If the doctor went to the orphanage, it would be placing Australian troops that would accompany him at risk from both the roads and the militia. Ultimately, thank goodness, the final decision was not mine, but I did have to provide the recommendation to the senior officer. The consequences of allowing people to go to the aid of this child would be too far reaching. Thus, I recommended that the doctor did not go. And I believe that the child died as a result of her injuries because of my recommendation. All of that tragedy aside, however, there were many unusual and humorous incidents in that time I spent in Dilly. There was one really funny occasion when I was on picket with another officer around the perimeter of our camp. It was the middle of the night. For some, somehow I always got the middle of the night pickets and it always was quite frightening. The officer I was with was frightened too, but he would never like me to tell you that. We really wanted the guys on the other side of the fence to know that we were there. We didn't want to surprise them and give them a shock and end up being shot. So we decided to sing. And it also filled in the time. We had a, quite a few hours of walking up and down. But strangely, we couldn't really remember any lyrics to any songs. The only ones that came to mind were those fabulous groovy hymns from the 1970s that my primary school teacher at St. Kevin's in DY taught me in year three. So we began to sing Lord of the Dance. But to our incredible amazement, the guys on the other side of the fence joined in. It was just amazing. So during that time, I witnessed the results of the years of occupation and violence in Timor-Leste and, and was privileged to feel the true courage and strength of the Timorese spirit. However, it wasn't until I had my own children that I really understood the impact on those women and their children, those mothers and babies who went through so much, watching all their men folk slaughtered, taken as prisoners, raped and kept as wives for the militia and the Indonesians. I had no idea that the journey of friendship I was embarking on in 99 would change my life, and I really didn't anticipate the love I'd grow to feel for the East Timorese people. It has influenced every part of my existence and that of all my family and friends. Now, Australia's had ties to East Timor for far longer than most people are aware. In World War II, over 40,000 East Timorese died as a result of helping our Australian soldiers. At the time, we promised them friendship and protection, and we have let them down time and time again. Timor-Leste is one of our closest neighbours. It's only an hour's flight from Darwin, one of the world's newest nations and the poorest countries in the region. Years on from independence, the rural areas are still among the most disadvantaged places on the face of the earth. In those years of occupation, over 200,000 Timorese died. And the country now is not at the level it was in the 1950s. In 1999, I tried to extend my deployment. I didn't want to leave. There was still so much to be done. It felt wrong to leave a job unfinished and to leave these people I'd grown so close to. The lack of communication I had with people at home had become, meant relationships had become strained. It was very difficult to talk to people at home anymore. I'd grown, grown really close to the guys I was living with in Dili. We had an understanding and a bond that we could never explain to someone who hadn't experienced what we were going through. We'd become like a family. My extension of service was not approved. I had jobs waiting elsewhere in the world. When I left the country, I left a part of my heart and my soul there. More deployments and four children later, I was doing an Anzac Day presentation at a local primary school. The children asked the usual questions about warfare, death, weapons, and I steered the conversation to peacekeeping and peacemaking because as a military officer, I felt that that was my role. In the service of others, I was meant to protect them, make life safer, and especially for vulnerable women and children. This led to a discussion about Timor-Leste and the children were so interested that the principal asked me back to speak to the whole school about it and tell them my experiences in the country. Well, it snowballed. The, those Northern Beaches primary school kids wanted to do something to help others. The children and staff of Maria Regina Catholic Primary School in Avalon took the Timorese people into their hearts. 
a friendship link with a school in the village of Soibada in Timor-Leste was established. But before long, an official, official agreement was signed between our two local governments. It was like a roller coaster. I continued to meet by chance or by fate, people and organisations interested in getting on board. Now, none of this was part of my plan. I can't take credit for any of it. Many other primary schools and high schools are partnered now with Soibada. Churches of all denominations, surf clubs, RSLs, rotary clubs and community groups. It has simply blown me away. People I've met in cafes or on buses have volunteered to help and the Friends of Soibada charity became registered as an official charity in 2010. Before COVID, we managed to travel to the village twice a year with groups of volunteers. The village of Soibada is really remote and breathtakingly beautiful. It's high in the mountains and was originally built by the Portuguese, so the history is very significant. It was the first school and college in Timor-Leste and it's where all her current leaders did their schooling. So that made it quite a target back during the fight for independence because that's where most of the independence guerrilla leaders had trained, so it was targeted by the militia. Most of the people in Sobada are subsistence farmers. And I've been really fortunate to experience the love and strength of that community in Sobada. They've welcomed me and the many people I take with me into their homes and into their families. There's a true sense of happiness and peace in the village that often eludes us here. And it's devastatingly poor by our standards, lacking in so many basic resources and after all they've suffered, they still have this inner strength and positive outlook that's enviable. The children show care and concern for each other. And it's so different to how we live here in our communities. One example I have that's quite amazing, it was in one of our first visits. We take over knitted and crocheted blankets through the Wraps With Love organisation to distribute, because it's quite cold in the mountains. We'd handed out probably 100 to the children living in the convent, the orphanage, with the nuns. The next day, hundreds of children from the village turned up at the convent to see us, asking for blankets. We didn't have enough for all of them, and nobody asked the children from the orphanage to go back to their dormitory and get their blankets, but that's what they did. No one asked them to give away something that was their prized possession to the children of the village, and it was so remarkable. It wasn't something I could imagine happening here. These kids who had hardly anything knew that the children in the village had less and they gave them what we'd only gifted them the day before. So through the charity Friends of Sobata, I've learned so much. We provide aid to the village in the form of sustainable development projects, but we provide it under the direction of that community. It's imperative that we listen to the local leaders in Sobata and be guided by them as to what sort of assistance we offer. It's their village, their future, and they must have ownership of any project that we work with. At the moment, our focus is education, health, and small business development. Hopefully, in this way, we can repay some of the debt remaining from Australia's promises of World War II. The community of Soibata has access to resources and tradesmen qualified to do work themselves. So through our fundraising here in Australia, even during COVID, we managed to pay their wages and buy materials. This way, we assist in stimulating the local economy by providing jobs and giving them a means to help themselves. We work very closely with the chiefs, the school principals, the doctors and community leaders, and we fund a wide variety of projects. Some of these include things like uh, a training centre and a guest house so that our volunteers have somewhere to stay while they can run training courses for the locals that will help them then earn an income for themselves. We recently have, well, we've almost completed a hospitality training centre where the young people in the village can be taught tourism, how to wait tables, how to maintain a guest house, so that one day when tourists can visit the village, that'll be a source of in income for everyone. Days for Girls is another program that we run, and that's an amazing program that's run all over the world. Um, Girls miss so many days of school a year because of their periods. And these are washable sanitary pads that are distributed in kits to all the high school girls. We've even set up workshops over there and taught the locals how to make them. I was very fortunate that one of my friends on board a naval ship took all the sewing machines over for me a couple of years ago. And interestingly enough, the volunteers in the village wanting to learn how to make these were mostly men. And it was just an amazing, empowering thing 
to see these girls free to go to school whenever they wanted to and not restricted. Water and sanitation is a big project too. Um, we recently put um, guttering and big water tanks at the maternity clinic, but something as simple as mother and baby bags is what's really changed lives. The doctors asked us a few years ago to help them get the young women who give, to give birth in the clinic rather than at home. And so we came up with a plan of just a simple bag full of baby gear with a, a message on it in Teton that says, welcome to the world with love from your friends on the northern beaches. And we would fill it with everything a new mum would need. Often I'd just buy it in Timor, but the, there's groups here in Sydney who'll make baby clothes and blankets to go in there. So it's all very personal and made with love. The doctors now hand those out as the women come to give birth and it has really decreased the uh, death rate and it's a fantastic, very simple project. The, um, the surf clubs up on the northern beaches have sent people over to teach CPR. That was a request of the villagers. Some of them are so remote they don't have access to medical help. So we run tr CPR training. Um, Newport Surf Club donated the mannequins and it's an, it had an amazing effect on everyone in the village. So there's medical support, craft cooperatives, um, nutrition and gardening, gardening training. It's just an amazing experience and the village know how hard we're working to raise money to support them in their endeavours. But most importantly, the effect this is having on Australian children is quite phenomenal. I speak regularly in schools and lots of schools help raise money for these projects. Our children are so privileged here, they have no idea what it's like to live in the situation that these young kids face in a village like Soibada. So it's very, very good for our kids to look outside themselves and, and try and do something for others. And to me, it's really encouraging to see the sense of social justice that our teenagers have here. It's very heartening in the current world to know that our teenagers, as much as they often get a bad rap, are really doing so much and reaching out to help others. And I think that's one of the greatest things I've found. I'm really blessed to be part of this charity. I'm blessed to be accepted into the village of Sobata. When I go back there, I feel like the weight of the memories of 1999 are lifted from me. And I can see the positive outcomes of that deployment. Everything that happened in 99 has led to something good happening now. I hope that by sharing my story, a story of healing through serving others, I can make a difference. It might just help the people of Timor-Leste because their story needs to be told. And as neighbours, we must support them after letting them down so many times in the past. My story might help other veterans suffering from the mental health consequences of conflict. And there's certainly many of them out there now who need our support now, encouragement and love. My story may provide hope for women who've endured a, the long lasting effects of abuse, particularly in a male dominated environment. My book, when I finish it, might help others understand that everyone, even an ordinary person like me, can change the world for someone else and heal themselves while doing it. Thank you.